Okay, so let's start today's lecture, Bacterial Genomes and Diversity. So the two questions we're going to address today are, how are bacterial genomes organized and how many genes does a free-living organism need? So what we're starting today and what we'll be continuing through the rest of the course is me introducing you to some genomes and, and genes in genomes and, and um, what's interesting about those genomes and what they tell us about the organisms um, in which they reside. And um, so you'll see the, some examples today and pretty much for the rest of the course we're going to be sort of uh, looking at genomes and what they tell us. Um, and one of the genomes I'm going to be introducing you to, to today um, is, in a sense, the smallest genome we know of, of an organism that's what's called a free-living organism. That is, um, you can grow it on a Petri dish in a lab the same way you grew your E. coli cells from last week. Um, there are many organisms that are parasites that have smaller genomes, and you can imagine if you're a parasite, then you can throw out some of your genes because you're basically just stealing your host organism's genes, right? So if I'm a parasite, a bacterium that infects humans, um, I might not need a lot of genes. I just need the ones that are special to me and because a lot of the things, the host, the human that I'm infecting is actually going to provide. So a free li living organism is one that doesn't have any kind of obligate parasitism relationship. It can grow in a dish. It can grow in a culture. Um, and so. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the organism that, as I said, is our best example of one that has the smallest genome, and that's a way of getting at the question of how many genes do you actually need to be alive. Okay, but we're going to start with um, what is in many ways a typical bacterial genome, that of E. coli. So you know what E. coli is. You've actually held E. coli in your gloved hands uh, last week. Um, you have, you know, billions of them in your body right now. Um, they're an extreme, E. coli is extremely well studied, major, major laboratory organism, and so it's not surprising that the genome of E. coli was one of the first to be sequenced down to the every, every single nucleotide. Um, as it turns out, the E. coli genome is big. It's on the big end of the range, uh, as you'll see, for bacteria. Um, and as you can also see from looking at this picture, which I'll explain in a second, is that um, even sort of a simple bacterium like E. coli, you know, it's, it's basically, if you look under a very, very high power microscope, it's just a rod-like cell, and the cells grow and divide and grow and divide, and, and um, that's about all there is to it. Um, but even an organism like that can have a fairly complicated genome. And so the, the size of the genome for E. coli is about 5 million nucleotides. So how does that compare to the size of your genome? Is it 10 times smaller, 100 times smaller, 1,000 times smaller? 5 million letters? How big is your genome? It's smaller, yeah. Okay, so E. coli is smaller than your genome. That's a good start. Um, 10 times smaller, 100 times smaller, 1,000 times smaller, 10,000 times smaller? <laughs> Give me a guess. 10, 100, 1,000 times? 10,000. Other guesses? Anyone, anyone know the numbers? So it's, it's a little less than 1,000 times smaller, okay, because your genome is approximately 3 billion letters, and this is approximately a handful of million letters. So million, billion, thousandfold difference, okay? But still, 5 million letters is nothing to, nothing to laugh at, right? This is a very complicated genome, and what you're seeing here is a representation of the whole genome. So the genome of E. coli, instead of your genome, which has linear chromosomes that have an end uh, and another end, um, the E. coli genome has one chromosome and it's a circle, okay? So there's no end to it. It's just one big circle of DNA. You can imagine one of your chromosomes just joined at the two ends, okay? So you get a circle. So that's what's shown here. The entire e, e. coli genome is a circle. And um, in red and in blue are where the genes are, okay? And you can't see this. We're going to zoom in on this in a, in a little bit. Uh, but each one of these is actually an arrowhead pointing either that way or that way. And so each one of these little things is, is, is where a gene is. 
Okay? And we talked about last time how a computer can actually figure that out pretty well, right? You look for start codons and stop codons, and they can't be too close together, and then you know you probably have a gene. Um, and so a computer can sort of take those five million letters and do a, a decent job of finding where all the genes are. And plus, E. coli has been studied for a really long time, so a lot of these genes, their sequences were actually known already. And so once you have the full genome sequence, you can just line up the genes you know and say, uh -huh, I, I have a sequence that exactly matches right here, and so I know that gene is right there. These other colors we're going to talk about in a second. They're uh, basically the other thing we talked about last time, which is when you have a sequence of a protein, you often have some information then about what that protein does. Because just looking at that sequence can tell you, oh, this looks like an enzyme of this kind, or it looks like a structural protein like collagen of this kind. Um, and so these colors, which we'll get to in a second, um, are sort of categories of functions that are represented by each of the genes. Okay, and, and so this is, a, this is just sort of the zoomed out view so you can see the entire genome, but obviously there's a lot going on here, and so it's helpful to zoom in and look at just a part of the genome. So this is a more zoomed in uh, view. This is about 400,000 letters instead of 5 million. So this is about 10% of the E. coli genome, and you can start to see in a little bit more detail the features. So you can see these blue arrows going this way, the red arrows going this way, those again are, are genes, right? And, and the names of the genes are what's sort of drawn up here. There's so many that you can't just label them down here. So we have, you know, the C gene is this one, okay? And the YAD-D gene is this one. And, they, and a lot of them are named. Um, and uh, many of them were actually named before the genome sequences came around. People had just been studying, studying them individually. Um, okay. so. We still have in this 10% of the genome a large number of genes because the E. coli genome has several thousand genes, four or five thousand genes. Okay, so this is about um, four or five hundred genes in this view. Okay, you can start to see these colors here, and we're going to get to those about what, what those actually mean. Why is it that um, all the blue arrows are facing that way and all the red arrows are facing that way? Why do you think that is? Right, so, so we can draw the genome as a circle, as just a single line, like this gray line, okay? But when we draw that, what we really mean is we have a double helix, and we have one strand going this way and an exactly complementary strand going the other way. And as you know, that directionality extends to transcription, so the making of a messenger RNA. And so uh, a messenger RNA is either read off of this strand or read off of this strand, and for any given gene, it could be either one. And so this gene, for example, is read off the top strand going that way, and this gene is read off the bottom strand going that way. And that gives you, an, again, a sort of sense of the genome that it's, you know, it's not like all the genes are on the same strand, right? In fact, it's about 50-50. Okay, before we try and understand this anymore, let's zoom in one more time, okay? So now what we're looking at is about 60,000 bases, 60,000 DNA letters, so that's about 1% of the genome, okay? There are 100 more of chunks of about this size in the genome, okay? And now we can actually start to read uh, letter, letters in the names of the genes. We can actually see the extent of each gene. Um, and so, for example, we can see here this lone blue gene, arc A facing this way in this sea of red genes facing that way, which have various names, okay? And so we're starting to get sort of almost down to, you know, the individual level of, you know, of, of individual genes here, okay? And here it becomes useful to actually start to th consider these colors that are shown. So um, I showed you on the um, previous slides that these colors were here representing the functional categories that these genes fall into. And at this level of, of Zooming, it's really hard to make out sort of if there's any pattern here. It looks like just sort of rainbow colors going around, okay? Um, but at this level, you can start to see that it comes in chunks. Like, for example, this string of genes right here all has the same functional category, okay? So what are these functional categories? Um, here's the legend for this same exact picture, okay? So we can start to match up what these colors mean in terms of the functions of the genes, and you'll see some interesting things. 
Okay. So first, um, let's start at the top of the legend. So we have the what are usually called the forward and the reverse strand, although it's arbitrary which one you call forward and which one re you call reverse. And those are those red ones going this way and the blue ones going that way. Okay. Some genes, and I think I mentioned this in a previous lecture, don't encode proteins. Okay. They make an RNA, but then it's the RNA that, that is actually functional. It doesn't need to be translated into a protein. And you already know one example of a functional RNA, and that's transfer RNA, okay? tRNAs, which are the adapter molecules that allow translation to actually happen. Those are what are called functional RNAs because they don't get made into a protein. They're just doing their job as an RNA. Um, and so uh, a few of the genes in e. e. coli are like that. And so if instead of seeing red or blue, you saw pink or light blue, then those would be RNA genes instead of protein encoding genes. Okay. And then here are all of these functional categories. You don't have to worry about what this acronym COG means. Um, but functional categories are sort of not the specific name of an enzyme, not like DNA polymerase, but a category. So a, b a broader grouping of, of types of um, functions that proteins perform. And you can see the categories fall into things like information storage and processing. So information is DNA, right? It's, it's genetic information. And you can see what falls into this category. So anywhere you would see an orange along here is transcription, so the process of making RNA out of DNA. Anything that's beige is DNA replication, the process of, of making copies of the DNA so the cells can divide. And anything that's red is translation, that is making RNA into protein. Okay, so this is sort of the core, what I call the central dogma of molecular biology, right? Anything that's part of that central dogma is in this category, and it would show up here as being beige, orange, or red, okay? Then we have some other things, so cellular processes, things like cell division and chromosome partitioning. So not copying the DNA itself, but moving, moving the chromosome around so that it gets divided equally between cells. That's a type of function that gets performed inside the cell. Um, cell motility. That's moving the cell around. So as you know, a lot of microorganisms have cilia or flagella on them. So these things that sort of beat so that the, the, these little microorganisms can basically swim. Okay? So if there were a protein that was involved in, in building a flagellum, for example, it would, it would be in this sort of greenish color. Um, metabolism. We've talked about metabolism a little bit last lecture, right, in the context of lactose and how the cells metabolize lactose into its two component sugars. Um, and so there are categories here like carbohydrate transport and metabolism. That, for example, the lac operon, which we talked about last time, would fall into this category. It would be purple. Okay? Uh, lipid metabolism would be this blue color, um, and so on. And then there are some still that are what are called poorly char characterized. Um, either the functional prediction is so general that it doesn't really fall into any of these categories, um, or it's completely unknown. That is, just looking at the sequence, you can't tell what that protein does. No one studied that gene before, and so it would be this gray color. But one of the things you notice is that most things can be assigned a color. Okay? So just from either prior research in the molecular biology laboratory or from the DNA sequence itself, we can assign almost all genes to uh, functional categories. Okay? And so as I said, you can start to look then and see if there are any patterns. So for example, this set of genes here, uh, all on the same strand, all pointing the same direction, right next to each other, all have the same functional category, which is this uh, purplish uh, NYU color. Okay? So if we look that up, we have amino acid uh, transport and metabolism. So that would be things that are, for example, bringing amino acids into the cell or making amino acids. Um, and if there are enzymes involved in that, those would get that color. Okay? And so what do you notice in addition about these genes here, if you look at their names? Can't see it yet, so I'm going to zoom in again. Yeah, so this is that part right here. Okay, I'm zooming in again. So now we're dealing with only about 10,000 letters. Each of these tick marks is 1,000, the big tick marks. Okay, so what we have here is all of these genes with this magenta purple color. Okay, there are three genes actually, and they're called 
THRA, THRB, THRC. What do you think that is? What word would you give that? Operon. Okay. Similar to the LAC operon, which had genes that were next to each other that are performing related functions, these are a set of three genes that are important for the synthesis of the amino acid threonine. Okay. So this is what we would call the threonine operon. Um, how do you think you would, the cell would regulate the activity of these genes? Okay. So we talked last time about how the cell regulates the activity of the genes for lactose permease and beta-galactosidase, regulating it based on the presence uh, or absence of lactose. How do you think the threonine um, genes would be regulated? Okay. So we, basically, what I'm asking for is what we usually call in science a model. Okay, a model being an explanation of the existing facts that then generates predictions that you can test experimentally. Okay, so what I'm asking you for is a model for how the activity of these three genes might be regulated. Yeah, so, so in particular, which amino acid? <coughs> threonine. Okay, so these three genes are required to synthesize threonine. Okay, so our model is going to be that somehow the activity of these genes is regulated by the presence or absence of threonine. Okay, and so would you want these genes active when there is threonine or when there's not threonine? Okay, I'm going to take a poll here. Okay, left hand, you would want to activate these three genes when there's no threonine around, and right hand, you would want to activate these genes when there's plenty of threonine around. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. How did we do? Uh, most of you are wrong. Okay, now if this were the lactose op operon, you'd all be right. Okay? Because remember, with lactose, the genes were activated when lactose was present. present because the job of the genes was to break down lactose. Okay? But here, what I said is the job of these genes is to make threonine. Okay? So when do you want to make threonine? When you don't have any threonine. Okay? So our model is that when threonine is present, these three genes are silent. They're, they're repressed. They're not active. When threonine is, is absent, then these genes are activated so that the cell can make threonine. Because without threonine, they can't make any protein. OK, does that make sense? OK. So th these three genes were actually known well before there was any genome sequence. Okay, people had been studying metabolism in E. coli. They knew that there were genes that encoded enzymes that are needed to make threonine. Um, and these three genes had been identified already. So, so what does having a genomic sequence actually add? Right? One, of the, one of the things that I've been saying all along is by getting a genome sequence, you can actually learn more and do more. Okay? Uh, but that doesn't apply in this case. So I want to show you an example where the knowledge was very incomplete and where having the genome sequence basically instantly led to discovery. Okay? So that example is one that's uh, talked about in one of your required reading articles. Um, and it has to do with um, so-called aromatic compounds. So aromatic compounds are called aromatic compounds because they smell either good or bad. Okay, um, and chemically, what that means is they have a benzene ring. Okay, so this chemical feature here, this hexagon with alternating double bonds, is benzene. Okay, and there are a lot of compounds out there that are modified versions of benzene. This is one called hydrocinamic acid. Okay, so from the name cinamic acid, you could probably guess um, where it comes from. It's a it's a major component of cinnamon. Okay, when cinnamon oil sits in the presence of oxygen, it gets turned into this acid. And so if you had a tube full of this compound, you'd know you had it because you'd be smelling cinnamon. Okay? 
And so E. coli, like a lot of other bacteria, can convert these um, aromatic compounds into other compounds that it could use for energy. Okay, so it has a whole biochemical pathway that degrades hydrocinamic acid and converts it into other things. Okay, and so before, and, that, and this is what the pathway looks like. I don't care that you know, you know the pathway, but I just want to sort of sh give you a sense of what you're looking at, right? So you have these chemical compounds, right? And all of these are intermediates until you finally get to these two compounds, which are used for energy, okay? So you start with hydrocinamic acid, and then you end up with these two things, which are used for energy. And there are these intermediate compounds. And the reason there are these intermediates is there are a series of enzymes that do the converting. So you have this HCAA enzyme that converts this into this. You have HCAB that converts that into that, and so on, until you finally get to the end. Okay, It's like a little assembly line or disassembly line. Um, and so before the genome sequence of E. coli was determined, only two of these genes had actually been identified, MHPB and MHPE. The other enzymes, it was known that they had to exist. Okay? It was known that the cells had those enzymes, but it wasn't known what gene encoded what enzyme. Okay? And if you know what gene encodes an enzyme, you can do a lot more studies uh, about these chemical reactions. And so it was really important to figure out what genes were encoding these other components of this biochemical pathway. Okay? And so I want to show you sort of how that works once you have a genome sequence. So I'm going to go to this uh, website here. So this is um, a really cool website that allows you to do this kind of zooming on the E. coli uh, or any bacterial or whatever genome exists in their database. Um, and so you start with sort of the zoomed out view, and then you can zoom in as much as you want. Okay, so here I just zoom in. I'm going to rotate around because I know where, the, um, where these MHP genes are. Okay, and just going to find those genes. Okay, I think that's them right there, but let's see if I do that. Are they still on there? Yeah, okay. So, um, now remember, two of these genes were already known, okay? So it's easy enough to then look on the genome where those two genes are, okay? And where they are is there's E, and what was the other one I said, B? Um, they're right here next to each other on the chromosome, okay? And in fact, there are a series of genes that are right next to each other right here. And so our inference then is those are probably an operon, okay? They're uh, probably a series of genes that are transcribed at the same time encoding proteins that are doing related functions, okay? And so you can see what these genes are named now, uh, B, C, D, F, T, E, A, okay? So it was very quickly discovered, once you know that bacterial genes tend to fall into operons, and once you know a couple of genes and where they fall in the genome, it was very easy to say, aha, uh -huh, here are all these genes. Um, that are next to each other, maybe these are the rest of that biochemical pathway. And indeed they were, okay? Because you can see by the names that it's these other things where the genes were not known, C, D, A, and so on. And basically in an instant, just looking at this genome sequence, those genes were discovered. Okay, and then it's very easy to say, yes, this gene encodes this enzyme because you can put, say, this chemical in a tube with the protein that comes from one of those genes in that operon and see if it actually converts that chemical into these chemicals, okay? And indeed it does. So now what we have is the MHP operon, okay, where all the genes now we know uh, exactly where they are and you have that complete biochemical pathway. 
Okay? And that's the kind of insight you can get by having the whole genome sequence that otherwise would have taken a really long time to find. You'd have to do individual studies to find the genes that are encoding each of these enzymes. Um, and those, in, ge in general, are hard experiments because you would basically have to mutate the cells and figure out that one of these conversion reactions is not taking place. But just having the genome sequence allows you to get there a lot quicker. Um, what is the C in the bracket for? Um, I don't even remember. Uh, we can try and find out. So. Um, one of the nice things about this interface is that you can cl click on any one of these genes and get some information about it. So uh, I just clicked on, um, which one did I click on? MHPC, okay? And then, uh, if you're, so if you're a working scientist working on this organism, it's really useful. You click on MHPC, um, you get what's now known to be its function, which is degrading one of those compounds in that biochemical pathway. Um, you get um, the gene sequence. So these are the actual letters of the gene. Um, you get the protein sequence. So that's the sequence of the protein. Um, and you get all kinds of other statistics on the gene. And I actually don't know what the C stands for. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's an example of the kind of discovery you can make, and, and as I said, the article in your reading um, sort of goes into this example and some others. Um, and at about the time that the E. coli genome sequence was completed, um, it was around 1997, and there were, at that time, there were 12 genome sequences that had been completed. Okay, so I want to sort of tell you about these organisms because these were the first ones. There, there had to be some reason people were interested in these organisms. Um, and, and then we'll get into how many there are now and what kinds of things people are studying. So um, the first organism on this list is different from the others. It's uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which I've talked about before. It's the common baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. It's what's used to make wine and beer and bread. Um, it's also a very, very important laboratory organism because um, it's a fungus. Okay, and as a fungus, that means it's it's more closely related to us than it is to a bacterium. Okay, so in a biologist way of viewing things, this thing looks a lot more like us than it does an E. coli cell. Okay, and that's because like us, it has a nucleus with chromosomes. Um, it has uh, certain uh, subcellular organelles that bacteria don't have. Um, and we can learn a lot about the way our own cells work by studying these guys. And so a lot of people do study those guys. Um, and so all this table is showing, and again, this is from the article that you're going to read, um, is the size of the genome. So the, the, the yeast genome is only about um, tw a little more than twice as big as the E. coli genome, okay? Not quite three times as big, so 12 million bases. Um, and it has about 6,000 genes. Okay, and this is just giving you a sense of sort of how many divide into known functions and unknown functions. So um, as of this writing, there were about 40% of the yeast genes that had unknown function. Okay, so let's go down the list now. So E. coli, you already know, looks like this, uh, has a genome of almost 5 million uh, base pairs, and it has about 4,000 genes. So what are these other guys on the list? Some of them have really, really strange names, and they are indeed really, really strange organisms. So Bacillus subtilis. Um, Bacillus subtilis is a common soil bacterium. If you go out into Washington Square pa Park and you pick up a big patch of soil and bring it back to the lab, you're likely to have a lot of Bacillus subtilis in it. It's studied for two main reasons. One reason is that, as you'll see in one of your future labs, Bacteria are broadly divided into what are called gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. You'll see what that means in lab. Basically, it comes down to they have different sort of cell walls. Um, and so E. coli is the canonical example of a gram-negative bacterium, and Bacillus subtilis is the canonical example of a gram-positive bacterium that is also very easy to use in the laboratory. It grows readily on the same kind of agar plates that you used in lab. Um, and so it's a really 
uh, major model organism now for studying gram-positive bacteria. The other reason it's important is that it's related to another bacterium called Bacillus anthracis. Okay, and as you can guess from the name, this Bacillus anthracis is the causative agent of anthrax. Okay, and so um, Bacillus subtilis is, is completely safe, right? And so if you're a researcher and you want to learn more about the biology of Bacillus anthracis, um, then it's a lot nicer to work with its close relative, Bacillus subtilis, than it is to actually work with Bacillus anthracis, where you have to be very careful about getting yourself killed. Um, okay, so we have these two major workhorses of bacterial genetics, E. coli and Bacillus subtilis, that were sequenced at about the same time. What else do we have on this list? We have something called Sinococystis, um, which, as you can tell from the picture, is green. Uh, the reason it's green is it's so-called cyanobacterium. Cyanobacteria, like plants, photosynthesize. Okay, so they have chlorophyll. That's the green pigment. And they use um, carbon dioxide and sunlight to make energy. Okay, and cyanobacteria are actually also the reason why plants can do that. So plants have chloroplasts in their cells. Chloroplasts are the... Uh, the organelles that do photosynthesis, they contain chlorophyll, they make energy out of sunlight and CO2, and, <coughs> excuse me, and as you'll see in a later lecture, the reason plants can do that is because at some point, way, way, way back in time, one cell ate another cell, and, and to be more specific, a eukaryotic cell ate a cyanobacterium, and instead of digesting the cyanobacterium, cyanobacterium, the cyanobacterium just sort of hung out there and stayed as a, a living thing inside of that eukaryotic cell and eventually evolved into the chloroplast. Okay, So studying this organism as a representative cyanobacterium um, is a way of sort of understanding the origin of plants, of green plants. Okay, what else do we have on this? So again, you know, this is a fairly large genome, three million something Base pairs, 3,000 genes or so. Okay, next guy on the list, Archaeoglobus fulgidus. Okay, they look like that. Okay, what are these guys? These guys are really strange. So they live in a very unusual place. They live at thermal vents in the deep ocean. Okay, so if you go offshore quite a bit, there are these thermal vents that are basically where sort of volcanic activity is taking place, and they're spewing up very, very superheated liquid. And uh, that liquid is, is very hot. It's basically boiling. And it contains a large amount of sulfur, OK, and very little oxygen. And so these organisms are unusual because instead of breathing oxygen, they breathe sulfur, OK? Um, and, and they represent a part of the tree of life that's very different from all these other guys. Um, and so they're interesting in that sense as just sort of a, you know, to be frank about it, a weirdo organism. You know, how is this thing living that doesn't breathe oxygen, it breathes sulfur? Okay? And so understanding its genome can maybe reveal um, the differences between those two ways of life. Okay, next guy on the list, Haemophilus influenzae. Okay. So this is our first example of something that's bad for you. Okay, uh, Haemophilus is a major cause of meningitis in children. Okay, um, it actually doesn't cause the flu, influenzae. Uh, this was a misnaming at some point before the flu virus was known. Okay, um, it's a bacterium and it causes disease. In, uh, as I said, it's a major cause of meningitis in children. Okay, um, and so it's a pathogen. And you can easily understand why um, it would be an important research uh, objective to understand the genomes of pathogens that have a large effect on human health. Okay? Learning about their genes, and I'll show you an example in a second of this, uh, learning about their genes will tell you something, hopefully, about how to deal with those pathogens. Okay? And we're start, as you notice, we're sort of going down the list, we're starting to get into smaller and smaller genomes. So this is less than 2 million bases, less than 2,000 genes. Okay, next guy on the list, Methanobacterium thermoautotrophicum. Okay, what is this guy? Um, this one's interesting. It produces methane. Okay, that's the that's where the name uh, Methanobacterium come from, and its its major use is in sewage treatment. 
So at sewage treatment plants, these bacteria are used to degrade sewage and convert it into something that you know, isn't going to cause problems if that water gets reused. Um, it's, also, um, it's also interesting because, as you might imagine, producing methane is, in a sense, producing a fuel. Okay? And so there's a lot of recent interest in microbes that can convert waste products into something that might be useful as a fuel that doesn't need to be sort of pulled out of the ground. Okay? So these organisms are also a, a sort of major study organism. Next guy on the list, Helicobacter pylori. Anyone heard of that? That's because none of you have any stress. Okay. Helicobacter pylori is, is a major uh, cause of ulcers, uh, stomach ulcers. Right? And you can see it's sort of nasty looking, right? It sort of attaches to your stomach and, and causes ulcers. Um, it's also thought, interestingly enough, and this is um, work that people at NYU are doing, uh, Marty Blazer up at the med school, um, it's also thought that it might be good for you. Okay? It's thought that uh, our overuse of antibiotics, especially in children, is leading to a decrease in, the, in sort of normal uh, infections with helicobacter. So helicobacter is present when you have an ulcer. It exacerbates the ulcer, um, but healthy people also have helicobacter. Okay? And it's thought that overuse of uh, antibiotics is getting rid of helicobacter, and it might be associated with a higher incidence of child allergies, like food allergies. It might be associated with a higher incidence of asthma, not the presence of the bacterium, but the absence of the bacterium. Okay? Next guy, another methane producer, Methanococcus. I don't even know how to say it, Yanashii, okay? Um, it's a methane producer. It also lives at these deep vents in the ocean, okay? Another sort of weirdo organism that's just sort of interesting in its own right. <coughs> Next one, Borrelia burgdorferi, burgdorferi. Anyone heard of this one? Anyone grow up in Connecticut? If you did, you probably have someone who's infected with it. Any guesses? Yeah, so this is the causative agent of Lyme disease. Okay? Uh, it's called a spirochete because of, you can see that the bacterium itself forms this really twisted knot of things. Another nasty, nasty guy um, where getting the genome sequence might help us figure out uh, how to deal with Lyme disease, which is, which is um, a big problem and, and not easy to treat. Okay, now we're getting down to smaller genome sizes, about a, a million bases, less than a thousand genes. Next guy, mycoplasma pneumoniae, major cause of pneumonia. Um, this one is what's called an obligate parasite. Okay, so you can't take mycoplasma pneumoniae and culture them on a dish. The only place these guys live is in, is in living hosts. Okay, for example, you or me. Okay? And as I said, it's common for obligate parasites to have smaller genomes because some of the genes they don't need. They just sort of steal stuff from, from their human host. And so mycoplasma pneumoniae has a really small genome, only 800,000 letters, 600-something genes. Okay? Now what's really interesting is the last guy on the list, mycoplasma genitalium, okay? um, similar related uh, bugs. But these guys, so these guys also cause infection. You can guess where. Um, but you can culture them in a dish. That means they're free living. So they don't need to be infecting a host to be alive. Okay? And they have a tiny genome. Okay? Only 600,000 letters and only 470 genes. Okay? Compare this to us. right? So we have 3 billion letters. They have 600,000. We have about 30,000 genes. They have fewer than 500 genes. Okay? And these guys we're going to get back to talking about because studying these guys is a way of really getting down to this question of you know, how many genes does an organism really need to be alive? Okay. But before we do, I just want to give you some more statistics about sort of where genome sequencing went after 1997. So in, as of 1997, there were 12 genome sequences that were known. Okay, and this is what happened afterwards. Okay, so there we are. 
first genome sequencing happened in the middle of the 1990s, okay? By 1997, 12 genomes, okay? Here we are today, as of the end of last year, 1,100 completed genome sequences, okay? And the rate of doubling, you can look at it here, is every two year, two to three years, we get a doubling in the number of genome sequences we have. And I would guess that, you know, next year when I'm giving this lecture, the bar for 2010 is going to be more than double here. And every year after that, it's actually going to be more exponential. It's not going to be um, uh, this trend, which is already exponential. It's, but it'll be an even higher trend because of the kinds of advances in the sequencing technologies that Paul talked about when he was here, okay? But here we are, um, not too many years later, okay? So in the decade from 1999 to 2009, we went to, from a handful of genomes to over 1,000 genomes that have been completed, and you'll see in a second how many are actually in progress right now. So this is a lot of genomes. and, and so I made this point before, but I think it's an important point. You know, a lot of people are familiar that there was a human genome project, okay, and that we now know the human genome sequence. But we know the genomes of many, many, many more organisms now, okay? And these genome sequences are telling us a lot about the natural world and about how life works, okay? And so um, a really useful resource for, for just sort of getting an, an appreciation of the kinds of things people are sequencing now to understand them better um, is this uh, Genome News Network site. And they have what they call their quick guide to sequence genomes, okay? So basically, you can go down this alphabetical list and find um, all the organisms where there's a genome project and something about those organisms, okay? So um, these guys we'll talk about later in the course. These guys. I've never even heard of, okay? And so um, I just want to show you sort of that page, right? And so you can, you know, just this, this, this could be, for example, a really useful resource for your projects, okay? Because it has some interesting organisms that you'll, you will have heard of before, or some interesting organisms you will not have heard of before. So for example, Anopheles gambii is a mosquito. It carries malaria. Um, Honeybees um, are the subject of a lot of research. Um, you can read the little blurb here about what it says about honeybees. They're endowed with a small brain but ample social skills, okay? So they're sort of a model organism for understanding how neural circuitry, the sort of cells within your brain, actually control complicated behaviors. Um, and obviously they're of extreme economic importance um, because many, many crops that are grown need honeybees to pollinate them, okay? And, and in the last few years, you've probably heard in the news about uh, colony collapse disorder and all the problems with honeybees around the world. Um, and so um, it's not surprising that these guys are a major, major organism that people are trying to study better. So I recommend this site as a way of um, getting ideas for your topics and just generally sort of finding interesting things. Okay, so... <coughs> um, I want to show you over the next few fly slides a, a, a few other ways of looking at the diversity of genome projects that are going on, because I think it's quite remarkable. So as I said, there's this major division of life between things that are like us, eukaryotes, with, with real cells, with nuclei, um, and mitochondria, um, and other organelles, um, and then bacteria, prokaryotes, um, that are simpler. They don't have those things. And so you can see that of the over 5,000 genome projects that are either completed or now in progress, and this is why I think it's going to go exponential, because we have about 1,200 completed, but there are over 5,000, probably 4,000 that are in progress right now. Um, about 1,300 of them are for eukaryotes, and about 4,000 of them are for prokaryotes, okay? And so just to give you the breakdown of eukaryotes, it might surprise you how diverse even among the eukaryotes these gen genome projects are. So what we have here are uh, sort of a pie chart of major groups of um, eukaryotic organisms, okay? And so uh, the big slice of the pie here, right, about a third of it is fungi. So things like baker's yeast um, and, and relatives of, of yeast are the major ones that fall into this category. Um, the next biggest piece of the pie here is just all plants, okay? But then the rest of this is all animals. So about half of the eukaryotes are animals, 
that half of them being sequenced are animals, um, about a third are fungi, and about, I don't know, what is that, a sixth are um, plants. And, and look at the breakdown of the animals. It's not just, say, insects and mammals, right? What do we have? We have protists. So you know what protists are? So probably in like elementary school, you went out and you got a drop of like pond water or rain water and put it on a microscope slide and you saw these like uh, euglena and paramecium, single cell organisms um, that live in sort of stagnant water. Um, a lot of protists, protists actually being sequenced. Um, arthropods, you know what arthropods are? So arthropods includes insects, Crustaceans are the major ones you've, you're familiar with. So there are a lot of flies that contribute to this 94 number, um, and probably like a lobster or a crab or something like that, too. Um, 84 mammals, OK? You all know what mammals are. This includes dog, kangaroo, human, orangutan, chimpanzee, gorilla, cat, lots of other interesting things, OK? Uh, almost 100 mammals now, genome projects. Um, oh, this one. Uh, what else we got? Roundworms. Why are there 65 roundworms on the list? Uh, another major model organism for laboratory research, sort of similar to the fly, is the nematode roundworm C. elegans. Okay? And so it and its relatives make up this number. 40 fish, 16 flatworms, corals, jellyfish, birds, mollusks, amphibians, reptiles, earthworms, sea urchins, sponges, and then 50 others that are so weird that they don't even fall into any of these categories. Okay? So this is an amazing diversity of life that's now being studied using genomics. It's not just the Human Genome Project. There are you know, the Sponge Genome Project, too. Okay. The other thing that might partially not surprise you and partially surprise you is where this research is taking place. Okay? So um, this is just broken down by country. So of the 5,000 or so genome projects that are either completed or in progress, it, it probably doesn't surprise you to find out that over 75% of them are in the US. Okay? But look where else genome projects are being conducted. Okay? So we have um, Japan and the UK have a lot of genome projects. Other places in Western Europe, there are some international consortia that span you know, many, many countries, um, about 100 of those. Um, and then uh, other places that may or may not surprise you. So China is big into genomics now. Um, Brazil has, what is it, 37 genome projects going. Okay? Uh, most of these are for agricultural products or uh, some tropical diseases. Um, Korea, many genome projects, uh, New Zealand and Australia. And then in, in some ways, the most interesting category is these 140 genome projects where the countries performing them are not major genomics players. They only have maybe one or two or a few genome projects going on, definitely less than 20. And so these countries include other countries in Europe, um, but also Latin America, uh, North America. Um, Start scanning down the list, uh, India, Russia, Taiwan, Israel, Singapore. Um, I sort of leave it as an exercise to you, if you're interested, to sort of look up what these countries are doing with genomics, OK? Um, keep scanning down the list. Iceland is big into genomics now because they have very, very good records of uh, human populations and sort of pedigrees and families. Um, Argentina, uh, Iran, genome projects, Chile. Genome projects. Okay. I mean, in some in some ways, it, it's 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 actually you'd almost wish this piece of the puzzle were less, right? That, it, but it, it is sort of reassuring how democratic, in a sense, the technology is. It's still expensive, and so for some of these countries, it's a huge investment to do even one or a few genome projects. Um, but the price keeps coming down, um, and so my guess is what's going to happen is the pie is going to get bigger. Um, and the shares for each country are also going to get bigger relative to the U.S. Okay, so that's some about sort of where um, the work is being done. The, I encourage you to look at this Genomes Online site because it, it's where I got all these statistics from. It has some other interesting charts. So one of, the, one of the other charts, which I don't have a slide for, is who funds the research, which is also always an interesting question. So 
as you might guess, the major funder of genome projects is the U.S. National Institutes of Health, okay, by far. Um, this, the U.S. agency that comes in second place and second place overall um, is one that might surprise you is the Department of Energy, okay. Again, interest in converting uh, or using, utilizing some organisms uh, for energy production. Um, Department of Defense also funds things like this. Um, the number three funder of genome proje projects is a private foundation called the Moore Foundation. Has anyone ever heard of the Moore Foundation? No. Sort of makes you want to find out what it is, though, right? They're the third major funder of genome projects, uh, bigger than, for example, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. www.moore.org, in case you're interested. Okay. So, there's a lot of genome sequencing going on out there, and then the question again returns to, well, what do you use it for? And I showed you some examples already. Um, I want to show you an example now of how it can be used for health-related research. Um, and, it, and I think it's just a great example, not just of that application, but just of any application where when you have not just one genome sequence, but two related genome sequences, and you can tell what's different about them that you really start to gain really interesting information. And so it goes back to E. coli, okay? And um, one of the things that a genome sequence gives you basically is what biologists usually call, the, call a parts list, okay? You can think of a genome sequence as the list of ingredients inside a cell, okay? The protein components of a cell, um, because each of those genes, for the most part, is encoding a protein. Okay, and so if you have the genome sequence, you have the parts list of that organism, right? And so one of the things that having more than one sequence allows you to do is to compare parts lists, okay? So you can say, well, what parts does E. coli have that Bacillus subtilis doesn't have? What parts does Homo sapiens have that chimpanzee doesn't have, right? And so one of the ways this is really useful is to compare uh, two different members of even the same species. Okay, so does anyone know what E. coli O157 is? It's in the news. Every couple of years, there's some flare-up, and it becomes and it enters the news. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, you had to stop e eating spinach for a while. That was E. coli O157. Uh, this year, there were issues in, um, there was a, some ground beef producer, which is the usual source of problems like this. Ground beef was tainted, had to have a recall. That was the culprit. Um, there was also Nestle Toll House refrigerated cookie dough that you slice and make cookies out of. These guys were in it, okay? Um, which I guess is fine as long as you bake the cookies, but a lot of people just like eating the dough, and so it caused problems. Um, so E. coli O157 is a, a pathogenic E. coli. As I said, normally, you know, you have, lot, you have billions of E. coli cells in you right now, and they're not causing a problem. In fact, you need them. Um, but there are versions of E. coli that are problematic. They cause disease, okay? Um, and so just, so what we have now is the E. coli genome sequence for normal E. coli and the E. coli genome sequence for O157. And just by reading off the parts list, you can tell why O157 is such a nasty character, okay? And so what this plot is showing, basically, is the differences between O157 and normal E. coli. So these, all these labeled things are things that are in O157 that are not in normal E. coli, okay? And I just want to highlight a few, okay? So there's these class of genes that are shown here that are fimbriae proteins, uh, long polar fimbriae um, adhesion proteins. Okay, what are those? Fimbriae is probably Latin. It means fringes. Okay, so E. coli O157 cells look different from normal E. coli cells. They have these sort of finger-like projections on the cell uh, outside. And what they do is they allow the E. coli to attach to other cells, in particular your cells, Okay, and so just by holding on to your cells, um, they're more dangerous than normal E. coli cells. Okay, it's part of how they cause problems is they attach to your cells. 
What else do these guys have? They have what's called a type 3 secretion syringe system, shigatoxin, shigatoxin, new toxin, okay? So toxin, toxin, okay? It's the thing that's poisoning you when these things are in your body, making you sick, okay? And this syringe system is a protein, a set of proteins that form together, and if you actually look at them under a very high power microscope, they look like a syringe, okay? So you can imagine what these E. coli cells have are a bunch of loaded syringes with toxins in them, okay? So they grab onto your cells, and they take their syringes, and they inject you with their toxins, okay? That's what makes them pathogenic instead of just being harmless. What else do they have? This is another sort of nasty thing that they do. They have a bunch of genes involved in iron transport and iron metabolism, okay? So normal E. coli don't have these genes. Um, and the reason is that they only need these genes if they're going to be stealing your iron, okay? So what O157 E. coli do is they infect your blood cells and steal the iron from your hemoglobin, okay? So they have these transport molecules that then bring the iron into their cells, taking it away from your cells, okay? And so that's why when you're infected with E. coli O157, you're injected with toxins and you're anemic because your iron is being stolen, okay? And you can get all that just by having the genome sequence, okay? And so if there's some other bug that comes along that starts infecting people, I'm sure that the first thing that's going to be done is it's going to have its genome sequenced, right? And just by sequencing its genome, you can learn a lot about how it's causing damage. Is it stealing iron? Is it injecting toxins? Is it attaching to the cells when the normal cells would not do that? Okay, so this is a really, really powerful method of understanding biology, of understanding how these guys cause disease when normal E. coli don't cause disease. And you can use this, as I said, this kind of comparative framework for looking at whatever organisms you care about. You can ask the question, what genes do we have that chimpanzees don't have? What genes does this breed of dog have that this breed of dog doesn't have? Okay. Another thing you can do with the parts list is ask the question, well, what's the minimal parts list? What gene functions does every cell need if it's going to be alive? Not this extra stuff, okay, but only the essential functions, right? So what I want you to do for a couple of minutes is um, break up into groups of like two or three or four, or whatever you feel like, okay? Just for a couple of minutes, I want you to discuss this question. If you were a cell that wanted to be alive, what kind of proteins would you need? Okay, and I'm going to give you a hint of the kind of thing I'm looking for. So, for example, you know that in order to be alive, a cell has to replicate its DNA and then make copies of the, of the DNA so that the cell can divide into two. Okay? So, one type of protein that every cell needs if it's going to be alive is DNA polymerase. Okay? It needs to copy DNA. Right? So, that's the kind of thing I want you to think about. What kinds of proteins does every cell need in order to be alive? And it doesn't have to be something where you know the name of it, like DNA polymerase. If you can think of some function that a cell probably needs to form, perform, you don't know what the enzyme is that does that, that's fine. Just write down what that function would be, okay? For example, if you thought iron transport was an essential function for every living organism, you would write down iron transport. You don't need to know the enzyme or the exact name of the protein that does that, okay? Everyone get the question? All right, take like two or three minutes and discuss it, and then we'll see what people come up with. 
OK. So I, I want to hear what you've come up with. So anyone want to volunteer an answer? Energy transformation. So what would be being transformed? So like sugars into energy. What else? You must have come up with some things. Um, whatever um, sugar DNA became RNA. Right. So en enzyme that converts DNA to RNA, so that performs transcription. So RNA polymerase. So some way to get the energy source from the outside of the cell into the cell. Okay. What else? So somehow dealing with waste products, exporting them or sort of converting them into something less toxic. Okay. Half a raised hand. So making amino acids, making nucleotides, basically making the building blocks of DNA, RNA, and protein. Right. So like for example, there are certain things that are essential amino acids for us you know, that we have to get from our diet. But most of the amino acids we actually make. Okay, so we can convert, say, sugar into amino acids. Not all of them. But something like E. coli can basically live without amino acids because it'll, it'll make them. What else? So, so adapting to the environment, so like dealing with different sugars or dealing with, with bad things in the environment or? So adapting to the environment, so okay. Transfer RNA. So you need the genes for the transfer RNA. You need the genes for the ribosome that makes proteins, right? Um, okay. So that's a good list to start. I think the things you came up with are very good answers to the question. Okay. And I hope what you also realize is that it's not necessarily a question that you can answer just from first principles by thinking about it, right? It would actually be nice to do an experiment and find out what the essential functions are because it's not always obvious, right? So. Um, what I'm going to tell you about now is sort of how we can do that experiment. So a good way to start is with an organism that has a really small genome already, because basically what you infer then is it's sort of gotten rid of or never had the genes that are sort of superfluous. Basically, the genes it has are probably really important. And so mycoplasma genitalium, um, as I told you, it has a tidy genome. It's only uh, less than 6,000 bases long. It's one-eighth the size of the E. coli genome, only 484 genes. So that's uh, almost as little as 10% of the E. coli genome. Okay? And it's not an obligate parasite, so it, it can grow on dishes. And so just to give you a sense of how much smaller the genome is, um, this is the depiction of the entire E. coli genome with its you know, 5 million letters and 5,000 um, genes. And this is Mycoplasma genitalium. And you can see, even at this view, which is as zoomed out as you can get, it's a lot more detailed than this view because you can actually pick out the individual genes. There are only 484 of them. Okay? Um, and so you know, zooming in to look at the individual genes of this organism is actually quite trivial. Um, so here's the map. right? And so I can expand just once. And I'm already at the scale of you know, seeing individual genes. Okay? And you can see. For example, this one here, DNAN, encodes DNA polymerase, or ADNA polymerase. Okay? So that's sort of the kind of thing we were looking for. You know, that's an essential gene. It copies DNA. Okay? And we can rotate around um, and sort of see, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this, okay, and see what other genes are there. Okay? And I'm going to go to, where is it? Just keep going around for a while uh, until we see something that, again, will, I think will be obvious to you. OK, here, 
um, big operon, right? RP, genes that start with RP, ribosomal protein, okay? So big chunk of the genome is, you know, DNA replication, protein production, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, there's that operon there with just a ton of ribosomal protein genes. And one of the things you can do, and this, this next slide is a kind of busy slide, but I'll walk you through it quickly, um, is take all of the genes that are in that genome and sort of categorize their functions and sort of draw a representation of a cell showing what those functions are. Okay? And if we break it down, I think this will make sense to you. So this whole section over here is nucleotide biosynthesis. That's making A's, C's, G's, T's, and U's. Okay? Um, so you can see here, for example, guanine, adenine, uracil, cytidine. So these are the chemical reactions that make the nucleotides. Okay? Carbohydrate metabolism, which is your other answer, making energy out of sugars. And you can see that this includes transporters, you know, bringing glucose into the cell, bringing other sugars into the cell. Phospholipid biosynthesis is making the cell membrane. So the major component of the cell membrane are these uh, fats called phospholipids. And um, the other thing that's not even shown on here is uh, the ribosome and the DNA polymerase, okay? So pretty much you got most of the answers to the question of, of what does this cell need. And then the other interesting thing here is that um, some of these functions that are in uh, green or some of them have a question mark here, those are enzymatic re reactions where the biochemistry says they have to be taking place. If those enzymatic reactions aren't taking place, then the rest of this can't happen. But there's no gene in the genome that's been identified as corresponding to that enzyme. Okay? So these are sort of, in a sense, also sparking discovery because they tell you, well, this is a part of this organism we don't understand. What part of this organism's genome is actually encoding this function that conver converts this into this? It's got to be there, but we don't know which gene it is. And so that leads to you know, doing experiments to try and figure that out. The other things that are interesting are these things that are in uh, black with the white lettering on them. Those are all genes that are not required. So you can make a mutant of these cells that doesn't have those genes, and the cells are still alive. So even though it only has 484 genes, not all of those are essential. You can actually get fewer genes and still have this, these guys alive. Um, and those experiments are actually fairly easy to do. I'm not going to explain the details of it, but basically what you do is you take a piece of DNA, and you insert it into a gene. And what that does is it disrupts the coding sequence of that gene so that it doesn't make the protein it normally would make. 